Hi, welcome to Swim Angelfish's lifeguard training. All of you trained lifeguards are doing a great job, but one thing that's missing in your training is knowing what to do for those swimmers with special needs that might need some additional strategies and tools and things for you to look out for. So we created this program using the acronym lifeguard to give you tips with each letter of the word lifeguard. And how you can use this that will complement your lifeguard training mm -hmm. and it will improve the way that you assess and look at swimmers that have some challenges that you yeah. see in the water. And if you're if working in programs that are offering more diversity and more inclusion programs, it's really a life-changing program that you really need to add to your toolbox for lifeguarding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're going to talk about, which Cindy's going to address, is look and listen, and that's the L. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're a little more aware of the way that you're look and listening, and maybe you're going to see things like maybe a little, a little ankle bracelet or a little wrist bracelet that mm -hmm. sometimes coincides with somebody who might have some autism or some bolting behaviors, that's a nice little sign to see and think to yourself when you look and you begin to listen to the way they're responding and reacting in the water, that this might be someone you're gonna have a special set of eyes on throughout the, their time at the aquatic center. The other thing is sometimes swimmers might come in with some headphones. Maybe they are a physically impaired swimmer, maybe they have some sensory issues, but there's actually some kids that the sound is so overwhelming that they wear some headphones and they might wear it in and on the deck, but they might even wear it in the water a little bit. And that's another thing that you can look and see that you're gonna be assessing this person a little bit different. Good, good point. I'm gonna talk about I for identify, and I want you to understand some movements and some behaviors you might see in some of the swimmers that's gonna help you identify that they're gonna have some issues that might be different than you're used to. Mm -hmm. For example, a swimmer with maybe some signs of autism might look moving quickly or they're making a high-pitched noise or a funny kind of humming sound or flicking their wrists because they're looking for more sensory input as they flap their hands into their muscles and joints. You might think to yourself, whoa, I'm going to keep an extra eye. This person might run. This person might be a little impulsive. Or the swimmer that comes in that might be in a wheelchair, although that is more obvious, you might yeah. think to yourself, Oh, is the lift working? Let me get down there and see if I need to set anything up for them. Maybe I just need to be close by and give the parent a hand for helping them lift their child in and out of the pool. Identify the needs before they happen, just so you're proactive with what might be needed. Yeah, you might even see some gagging or coughing or swirling and spitting the water or biting on their shirt or biting on some of your equipment if you have it in the pool. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. so, so that brings us right to fun or frenzy. Mm -hmm. So in fun or frenzy, you might see things like, how many of you have a water slide or a splash pad where you're lifeguarding and the swimmer goes down and constantly turns around and just stands at the bottom and loves to just stay there, push the water, look at the water, maybe lick, splash. This person that's coming down the slide this shows you they might have some sensory issues, maybe they have autism, and if they keep doing it and you blow the whistle and then they cover their ears, it could be go from fun to a frenzy. So begin to identify those things and try to avoid the swimmer that's gonna overtake the bottom, the overtake some of the equipment, overtake different things in the pool. You might also see a fun or frenzy with swimmers that avoid certain things. They're swimming just fine, they see a drain cover, and they frantically run over other swimmers to get to the side. So looking at if fun or frenzy sometimes can relate to jets, drains, lane line, filters, groups of swimmers, looking at that and making some decisions about the way that you're going to lifeguard that. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you, you I, I think we do have some stories sometimes of in our own program because we do special needs adaptive swim. Some of our swimmers look like their fun turns into a frenzy that turns into an uh, uh, what a lifeguard thinks is going to be a need to jump in and save and we're kind of running no no that's just how they swim yeah or sometimes it creates a situation that starts out as fun and it becomes an overstimulating situation and then it becomes a little unsafe yeah so just keeping an eye out for that
I'm going to talk about the E in lifeguard, and that's expected versus unexpected, meaning touch, meaning noise. And there's so many examples of this and, and why it's important to understand. Many swimmers, whether they have motor issues, physical issues, sensory issues, um, really the whole gamut, can easily get afraid and thrown into fight and flight. Mm -hmm. And you can cause a panic response just from an unexpected whistle or from a loud yell or from a swim coach in the next lane that's yeah. cheering on his mm -hmm. coach. That could set a swimmer off into fear, into freak out. I have a swimmer that has a lot of physical impairments and when he hears that yell, he immediately bursts into hysterical crying. Mm -hmm. So recognizing these swimmers response to noise and understanding, ooh, that's causing them to go into fight and flight. Maybe I'll move the splashing down to that end of the pool and give them some space. Maybe I'll, you know, blow my whistle softly or not at all, or maybe I'll prepare them before I blow the whistle. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes if you can expect the noise, you can handle it better. And I want to talk about that also with to helping them and touching them. If you're trying to help a swimmer with a physical issue into the water, you don't wanna just, you know, one, two, three, grab the legs and think you know what you're doing. Always let them know what's happening. Is it okay if I take your legs? Okay, I'm gonna to touch you now. Or a swimmer that is um, not getting in the pool in the right area and you, you know, take them by the arm or guide them from the shoulder, always let them know that you're going to touch them. Expected touch is much more tolerated than unexpected. Yeah, and you're the expert, right? So if somebody has an accident in the pool mm. or a fire alarm goes out and you have to clear the pool yeah. and it's it's unexpected to you also, mm -hmm. you're going to be expected that you're going to be able to handle the situation. So how you're going to help somebody with a physical disability exit the pool when they weren't ready to do it or somebody that's having an over-emotional response and an extreme reaction because they went into fight or flight, how you're gonna manage that, talking them about, I'm gonna to touch your shoulder and then I'm gonna help you out of the pool. Yeah, That's great point, Aileen. So, so now it brings us actually right into give time and space. So giving time and space, but also doing your job as a lifeguard and keeping things safe, you might be questioning, well, how am I giving time and space when I really need to keep things safe and sometimes mm -hmm. it has to be super timely? Well, if you blow your whistle and a swimmer goes underwater and you need to clear the pool, and then you blow your whistle again and they go underwater again, this is a tip, this is a sign that something is going on with this swimmer maybe they cannot handle the sound of that whistle and you're going to have to walk over bend down get down eye to eye and and tell them time to go maybe gesture get out try something different yeah. other than continue blowing the whistle it might also be somebody that you want to go over and tell them stop doing unsafe jumping and as you're walking towards them they're looking at you and now they're walking faster away from you now you're afraid they're going to fall plus they're not going in the right direction so you start walking faster which makes them start to run this is what we're talking about this is an opportunity to really hone in on your assessment skills and say whoa Every time I walk, and now that I'm walking a little faster, it's creating them to run, and you want to yeah. avoid that. So maybe giving time and space, lowering yourself, and saying come might be a much better way to get them to walk towards you. You know, Cindy, you're making me think of something. A lot of times, some of our sensory kids react and take everything as a game of chase. Oh, yeah. So a lifeguard, if you're quickly approaching one of, a ki one of these kids, they will run faster. So maybe, again, anticipating the situation, you see a parent go in one direction mm -hmm. to get the child, maybe you go in the other direction so you can get them safely and you kind of both kind of can herd them into the direction you want them to go just to think about these things yeah little little tips and strategies to give time and space in order to have a safe pool environment which kind of brings us right to yeah understanding and understanding is making sure that swimmer is understanding the expectation the rules of the pool and what you're trying to tell them a lot of our swimmers regardless of what their issues are have difficulty with auditory processing a pool is a very acoustic environment there's a lot of background noise and it's very hard to filter what's being said 
On top of that, these kids have difficulty processing what you're saying if you don't allow time and give a pause. So if you quickly keep yelling directions at them, they're not even understanding mm -hmm. what you're saying. It's like their brain keeps resetting, right? So understanding that they might have an auditory processing delay and the tips for that would be to speak in smaller phrases, yeah. to pause, and to maybe say things simply like, First this, then this. First wait, when safe, then jump. Yep. I like that a lot. Yeah. And and approaching differently also if you're using a rescue tube. Mm -hmm. If if you're going to have potentially some behaviors, some kids, and especially in this case, kids with autism or sensory issues, when you approach from behind, it can cause alarm yeah. and be super scared. And you guys are trying to do the rescue the way that you learned it. Perhaps there might be some times where you have to modify and go on the side. You might have to modify, go on the front. You might even have to back away a little, push something and say, take it, because they're not gonna let you near mm -hmm. them to mm -hmm. touch them. Yeah, or mm -hmm. this might not be traditional in a lifeguard rescue, but instead of pulling them and bringing them to safety, you might have to prompt them yeah. along and just say, take side, so they understand the expectation. Because sometimes someone else just holding them and trying to move them, they, they'll be more resistant to that. So just understanding that is really important. And of course, we, we know that you need to do yeah. your job and that you've been trained, and we're not saying not to do things mm -hmm. at, at all to keep something unsafe but we're saying potentially there might be little increments of time that might for five seconds you try something different and all of a sudden it works yeah and I, along with that i i just kept it relay back a story where i had somebody i had a group of three boys that all had sensory issues and autism and we were all swimming and we were doing great and we had our little swim team going but one of the boys the way he swims is very vertical is very splashy and it did look like he might have been struggling and maybe drowning. And before the lifeguard could even say, do you need help, take side, he had jumped in, swam over, went to grab him, <laughs> and it was just a whole big commotion that didn't need to happen. <laughs> so. Wow, that's a crazy story. So so the next word is ask. Yeah. And sometimes this can be a little uncomfortable, but probably 99% of the time, the person's going to be happy that you asked. Mm -hmm. if, if you ask, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? I see, looks like your son has some sensory issues. What could I do to make your job, make your time at the pool safe? And they say, you know what? I would just like to introduce you to, to my son and, and let him know your name and let him know you're here to help us. Some, something simple. That, that just, is there anything I can do for you while you're yeah. here? I mean, this makes me think of like the, the child having a meltdown and really being extreme and having a tantrum on the floor. And as a lifeguard, you probably are just like, you never, you never saw something like this. I mean, I've seen this even with children that are in wheelchairs. When they, when they have a behavioral meltdown, you just probably don't even oh, yeah. know how to help. So better to ask, how can I help you, than mm -hmm. to not do anything. Mm -hmm. Parents will really appreciate that. And that brings us to risk management. Mm -hmm. Yep, and in risk management, we all want to keep things safe and avoid any kind of commotion, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. risk management, what would you like to say about that? I mean, there's a lot of coexisting conditions. So risk management, you know, you have policies for different things at yeah. your pool, but seizures, let's, let's just talk about that for example. Children on the autistic spectrum, children that might be in wheelchairs, these swimmers have co coexisting conditions of seizure disorders, which you might not realize. And a child might be underwater seeking sensory input, and then if they're underwater for a little bit too long, just be aware that there might be other things going on and always err on the side of caution. And if you're unsure, it's okay to ask the parent, are there any conditions that I should be aware of that could impact mm -hmm. the safety of your swim session? And you're all aware of underwater breath holding because that's mm -hmm. a big topic in the sw swim world. And for risk management, I have a swimmer, Emily, who loves going underwater. She yeah. uses a wheelchair, she can't walk, and she just loves to go the deeper she can go and stay on the bottom. And we need to help them understand, to help the parents understand understand I, I don't I, I don't want to see underwater so many times it might 
become a little bit of a dangerous situation. You might be, you know, could pass out. You can bring some of these things up and the parent might say, oh, well, I'll take him to the shallow end for 15, 20 minutes and I'll, I'll allow some structure jumping. Thank you for telling me. I, I didn't know it could actually become a problem. And I know you wanted to say something about the changing rooms. I wanted to say yeah. something about the changing rooms and the pool lifts. Because yeah. how many of you work at big facilities and never even used the chairlift? You don't want to be thrown into a situation as the lifeguard to have somebody come in and, you know, legally with the Americans with Disabilities Act, every pool should be accessible, right? And then you could be like, whoa, yeah, I know we have this lift, but I don't even know how to operate it or yeah. the battery's dead, so can't use it. Make sure you're on top of that kind of equipment yeah. and that you know how to use it. And the other thing about changing rooms in terms of risk management is you wanna make sure that the changing rooms are safe. A lot of times there are little skinny benches and then we have larger mm -hmm. swimmers in wheelchairs. Where are they going to lay down to change? Is, the, is it safe? Is there an environment where a mom could take her teenage son mm -hmm. and feel comfortable changing him where they don't have to go into the women's locker room? So thinking about that, making sure that you have an environment that is safe and inclusive. Yeah, and that brings us to yeah. diversity and inclusion. Perfect. So how is everyone in your community going to feel accepted? Well, they're going to feel accepted because you guys have the knowledge. And just understanding what these swimmers are needing. You know what? No one can fault you for not having the information, but we're here to tell you the information is available. So you are empowered by informing and educating yourself on what these swimmers might need. And guess what? If you don't know, ask the parents. Nothing makes them happier. We talked about it before. And just to, to wrap it up and to really make sure that you're using all of these resources well, we are constantly adding information. We're updating webinars. Follow us at Swim Angel Fish on all of our social handles, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have links for information in our bio. Mm -hmm. And continue to educate yourself and your whole swim facility yeah. so that these fa families feel welcomed yeah. and empowered to come and enjoy your pool. And your whole facility will have a more systematic mm -hmm. approach from, from the person that's in the engineering to the front desk, to the lifeguard, to the swim coaches. You'll have a more systematic way of having aquatic in-services by using some of our free free information. Yeah, and thank you today for investing in yourselves yeah. to get this education. We really appreciate it.